I trust you've all had an opportunity to enjoy your luncheon. And now I um, will be introducing Kathleen Barkley, who I, I just met as I was eating an oatmeal cookie. Um, <laughs> Kathleen was the hum <coughs> Chief Human Resources Officer and Senior Vice President at Global Human Resources for General Motors from 1998 until 2010. She held a similar position with the Kroger Company until her retirement in 2015. She has served on several boards. She's a member of the National Academy of Human Resources, former chair of the Academy's Board of Directors, and a three-time recipient of Automotive News's 100 Leading Women. Katie is also a generous supporter of Kevin's song, and we're honored that she is with us today. Katie? Thanks, John. And yeah, we just met about three minutes ago, and that chocolate, or no, it was oatmeal cookie that you were eating. It looked pretty darn good. I'm going after one of those as soon as I'm done here. Hey, by the way, isn't the food here fantastic? Wow. I was just talking to one of the managers at uh, the front desk, and I said, I don't think I've ever been to a hotel that has had such great service. I mean, they're all so kind, and uh, they do so much for you. So this is a wonderful venue to, to have this conference. Good job. Good job. Well, I feel really fortunate to be here for this conference. This is my first, and uh, over the last day and a half, I have learned so much. I've known about Kevin's song for a while, but I've never really had this kind of a deep dive on it, so I really appreciate being here. And like so many who have um, spoken to you over the last day and a half, and so many of you in this room, uh, suicide prevention and education is um, really important to me, and I'm very passionate about it because um, I had a, a niece uh, in her 30s, uh, a U.S. Army veteran who took her life a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, like everybody else, just uh, very shocking and very, very sad. And um, just about that same time, I was introduced to Kevin Song. And I was introduced to Kevin Song through um, some very dear friends of mine, Sharon and Leo Newhan, who I think are sitting at the back of the room. I have new contacts in, but I think I see you. And you know, Leo and his wife, Sharon, have been so instrumental in putting this whole conference together. I am so impressed, so kudos to you. And um, you know, to John and Gail Urso for bringing Kevin's song to life and creating such momentum over, frankly, a really short period of time. It is so, so impressive. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Dr. Michael uh, Anestis. I, I met Dr. Anestis this morning, and he recently published his first book called Guns and Suicide, an American Epidemic. He also published over 120 peer-reviewed articles, which I can't even imagine writing that many articles. In 2008, he was uh, named um, the Edwin Scheidman Award winner by the American Association of Suicidology for being the early career professional who's made the most pronounced contribution in the field of suicidology. And do you remember that name, Edwin Scheidman? He was, up, we, had, we saw his picture up earlier today. Uh, and so that is a very, very big award for Dr. Anestis. His presentation today is going to focus on family and community prevention toward curbing gun violence and reducing suicides. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Anestis. Where are you? There you are. All right, folks, just looking for the clicker. Here we are. All right. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you to the Ursos for having me come back. This is my second time at the Kevin Songs Conference, and I, I really enjoyed the experience last year. Uh, I really feel honored to be able to come back and speak to you guys. Um, so 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit outside of my normal comfort zone in that I'm going to sp talk about gun violence more broadly than just suicide. But as a suicidologist and being at a suicide prevention conference, a huge chunk of what I'm going to talk about is going to be suicide specific. But this is a broader topic than that. And I don't want to leave any sort of aspect of the issue sort of out in the cold or out in the shadows. And so I'll bounce around a little bit. Um, but again, this will largely be suicide focused. And when I was asked to come and, and speak, the idea was to talk a little bit about the pretty complicated relationship between mental illness and various forms of gun violence. Um, and so my hope today is to be able to sort of dispel some misunderstandings and give a very sort of unemotional, data-driven explanation for why I think things operate a little bit differently than the way we typically talk about it and why that matters, why it's important to maybe reflect things more along the lines of the data than we typically do and how that has implications for actually preventing these tragedies. I will say on the front end, I do realize that obviously suicide is a, is a sensitive topic for everybody and we're, we're all sort of um, aware of that. Gun violence adds a whole other level to this too. And so there's, there's a whole lot of perspectives um, that might be in conflict with one another on some of these in this room. Um, my hope is that regardless of where you stand on any of these issues, um, we can find some common ground in this presentation and focus on solutions. So as I do in every single presentation related to firearms, including when I was here last year, um, I lead off these talks with a disclaimer. Um, as I was saying, gun violence is a really sensitive topic. Um, and what I usually ask people to do is, is to close your eyes and think about the last time you had an argument with someone about firearms, and when the argument was done, you changed their mind or they changed yours. And, and typically, um, no one has a recollection of that ever happening because it doesn't work, right? And so if you're coming into this talk expecting uh, me to say one thing or another, my concern is that you might tune me out. Um, and that's not my goal. I, I work on gun violence prevention, but I do this in Mississippi. Um, so I've had to spend a lot of time learning how to make sure that, that this isn't about my perspective or my views on firearms. This is about preventing people from dying and how can we sort of all come around that shared goal in a way that people can sort of unify and, and make some progress. So I take a very pragmatic approach to things. So what am I not here to do today? I am not here to vilify firearm owners. Um, I'm just not. Uh, so I'm not here to disparage people to invalidate their culture um, or their beliefs. That's just not the point the point of this. This is also not going to be a talk about the validity of the Second Amendment. I'm not here to solve that. It's an interesting conversation. Um, we're not going to solve that today. So that's not what's going to happen. Um, I'm also not here to claim to be the most sort of experienced with firearms in the room. Uh, my experience is above zero. It's not a lot above zero. Um, and a really good way to lose credibility when you're talking about sensitive topics is to pretend to be something other than what you are. So I am upfront a nerd with minimal firearm experience. Um, my expertise is in the science, not in uh, my experience. And so I'm, I'm very open and aware of that and don't want to sort of portray myself any differently than that. Um, and then lastly, I'm also not here to blame suicide entirely on firearms. So I'm not saying that solutions I'm going to put forth and the ideas I am, I'm going to sort of claim are evidence-based will solve suicide for everyone forever. It's not the claim. So when I say we're going to talk about firearms, that's not me saying depression is not important. The same way when you say people shouldn't drink and drive, you're not saying, but it's OK not to wear your seatbelt. You can talk about one thing without dismissing the importance of another. It's a false choice. So I am not here to claim that firearms explain the whole story. I'm here to claim it explains an important part of the story, and we aren't talking about it nearly enough. And as a result, we aren't solving the problem nearly as effectively as we could. So yeah, I am here to talk about the scope of gun violence in America across its various forms and factors I think might contribute to some pretty sticky misperceptions that I think are, have taken over the way a lot of folks think about this issue. I'm going to openly discuss the role of firearms and suicide, but I'm going to do so in a way that isn't um, a rant on one side of the political spectrum or the other. It's just one that simply says, here's what we're learning from the science of it all and what I think we can do because of that. Um, and then I'm going to offer a path forward that I think will help us reduce the rate at which folks are dying from gunshot wounds in this country. 
Um, so hopefully these are things we can all rally around. And so let's start with some basics, just the scope of gun violence in the United States across its many forms. Um, and I think that we all hear you know, words like epidemic and we, and we understand that this is a big deal, but it helps sometimes to actually put numbers so that people can actually see the scope of things. And so when you're talking about how many people are impacted by gun violence, well, first of all, this slide's not comprehensive. There are, um, you can talk about how many people uh, develop PTSD uh, for seeing somebody or knowing somebody who'd been shot, right? Those folks are not reflected in these numbers. The scope of the problem goes well beyond wounds and death. This slide is about wounds and death because it's an easier thing to categorize and show you to give a sense of, oh, this is a big deal. But don't look at this slide and think this tells you the entire story of communities being impacted by gun violence. But let's talk some numbers. So they have, if you look at the CDC, they put out annual official numbers of these things. And unfortunately, it's always a couple years back. So this is 2017. Um, but the number of folks who were shot and had non-fatal gunshot wounds that required medical attention, 133,895 folks in the United States in a single year. And for a lot of these kinds of things, you get underestimates, and I assume this is a little bit, but less than you would be, if we were talking about number of people with intentional overdoses, you get an underestimation because a lot of folks don't get emergency care afterwards when they do this. Most folks end up seeing a doctor after being shot. So this is undoubtedly an underestimate, but not as severe a one as we have in other things. So around 133,000, 134,000 folks. But how many folks are dying each year? by firearms? Well, in 2017, it was just under 40,000 folks in this country in a single year who died from a gunshot wound, whether that was self-inflicted, whether it was an unintentional death, whether it was homicide. What surprised a lot of folks, and, and it's been mentioned, Representative Dingle mentioned it um, uh, in her presentation, is how many of those deaths are suicides. It's 23,854 in 2017. So right around 60%, a little shy of two thirds of all the gun deaths in this country were suicide deaths. And a good part of what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is that when we talk about gun violence in this country, particularly when the media discusses gun violence in this country, we typically talk about mass shootings. And that's an important topic, and I'll reiterate this again, I'm not here to say don't talk about those. Those are breathtakingly awful tragedies that deserve all the attention that they get. The problem is that gun violence most often takes one of two forms, suicide, or homicide outside the context of mass shootings, typically in underserved communities of color in urban environments, urban spaces, who are not getting the attention and the resources and the discussion they should in this conversation. And so the way we talk about and think about and represent gun violence is not actually in any way reflective of how it typically operates. And when you talk about things differently than they occur, you tend not to solve them very effectively. So then what would the cause be? Now, there is no single cause of gun violence. And anybody who says otherwise is dramatically oversimplifying a really complex phenomenon, right? But a couple of, when you ask people to say, what do you think is the primary, the biggest, even though we acknowledge a lot of things go into gun violence, what is the factor you think is the, the biggest contributor? A couple of, of ideas tend to sort of float to the surface most frequently. Um, one of them, and you can see this reflected in a Gallup poll from 2013, one of them is the idea of mental illness or failure to identify dangerous individuals, is how they, ter they termed it. And that's a little under half the respondents in their survey say that's the, the biggest issue. It's really, it's mental illness or our system is inability to identify ahead of time who the folks are who's dangerous. Um, and then the next highest cause is easy access to firearms. 40%. What's interesting about this is the same folks, Gallup put out a poll two years earlier, and the proportion that was primarily blaming mental illness or failure to identify stayed the same, but the proportion that was primarily blaming access to firearms substantially had gone down. And so what you see is a trend over time where people are thinking it's less about whether or not you can access a firearm and more about mental illness. That tells us that this is a very, again, sticky narrative, one that has permeated the way people think about this issue. And if that's how you think about the issue, that's how you're gonna think about the solutions as well, right? If this is the cause, then I need to address that cause to have an effective solution and resolve the problem. So why would people have this perception? Now, I, I, I'm not here to blame a single individual. That's not what this is about. This is not meant to be a political thing, but my point is that um, this 
I, this notion of mental illness is spoken about as a cause as high up as ranking officials go in our country. And so just after the El Paso and Dayton mass shootings, a reporter approached President Trump outside of Air Force One and, and asked, what executive actions are you prepared to take on guns? And his response was, I do want people to remember the words mental illness. These people are mentally ill. I think we have to start building institutions again. And there's a lot to unpack from that quote. Um, the use of these people as a way to make people be other and not you. The use of mental illness as a way to, first of all, d take attention away from firearms and focus on something that, again, a lot of folks, either because of stigma, don't talk about how it's like them, or because of stigma, assume it's somebody else's problem. And then talking about institutions, the way to solve this problem, as we do with so many things, is to institutionalize people, put them away. That's the response. And so this is not a perspective that's unique to President Trump. It's one that, again, permeates a large portion of the country. It's perhaps spelled out in a way that's particularly uh, tough in here. But this is the perspective. It comes from all the way, it goes all the way to the top. I'm not particularly interested, though, in what elected officials say the cause of gun violence is. Again, I'm the nerd. I'm interested in what the data say, right? And so what do the data say about this issue? Is there any reason from a scientific perspective to think that mental illness is what's driving this and therefore mental illness is the cause and the path to solutions? Um, well, no, actually. Um, so it turns out individuals who are diagnosed with one or more mental illnesses account for less than 5% of all crime in the United States. Now you could say, well, there's a lot of folks who don't have access to care and don't get diagnosed with mental illness. That is a great comeback, I agree. But then you're still going up from less than 5%. So the likelihood that the other 95 are coming from undiagnosed mental illness, that's a tough sell, man. But let's get a little bit deeper into the data. Let's look at crimes that are committed by folks who have been diagnosed with mental illness and crimes that are committed by folks who have not been. Well, it turns out the proportion of those crimes committed using a gun are lower in folks who have been diagnosed with mental illness than in folks who have not been. So folks with mental illness account for less crime than they account for population, right? So they're underrepresented in the crime totals. And then if they do commit a crime, they're less likely than folks without a mental illness to use a firearm in that crime. That is, again, a very tough obstacle to get past if you're then going to argue, but you know what the main cause of gun violence is? It's mental illness. That's tough, right? Also, mass shootings perpetrated by individuals with serious mental illness, which is, again, by far what, what most is heavily covered in the media, what saturates media coverage of, of gun violence, counts for less than 1% of all firearm-related homicides in the United States. Again, the story of American gun violence is not the story of a school shooting. That's an important story to tell, and that's an important problem to solve. And I'm not here to trivialize that at all. I'm simply going to point out that's not the story of American gun violence. And if that's all we talk about, that's all we try to solve, the problem isn't going away. So what else do we know? Well, it, as a scientist, what you would love to be able to do is say, well, let's look at this different groups of folks or these different factors and see what predicts the behavior in the future. Because that's really going to give us the most power for prevention, right? But gun violence, as big of a problem as it is, is still what we would call a low base rate phenomenon. There's not that many people doing it. So it's hard to design a study where you can say, well, let's predict who's going to shoot someone. You really can't do that very well, right? So you try to get as close as you can. And so one group of scientists, I think, did some pretty impressive work. They couldn't say, well, what's going to predict who shoots someone? But they were, were able to say, well, what's going to predict down the road who threatens someone with a firearm? It's not the same thing, right? So you want to be careful not to generalize too much, but it's not nothing. And what they found is that mental health diagnoses were not associated with down the road threatening someone with a firearm. But you know what was? Access to firearms, 18.5% increase. And you might look at that and be like, well, no kidding. Of course you're more likely to threaten someone with a gun if you have a gun. And my point is, yeah, no kidding. You're supposed to, if you have access to a gun, you're more likely to threaten someone with a gun. So it becomes really hard to then say access to firearms is not a leading factor in this process, right? If we find ourselves saying no kidding, you got to step back and be, say, what do I mean no kidding? We also know that mental illness is a robust predictor of thinking about suicide. So one of the studies I like to cite a lot, there's this huge epidemiological study called the National Comorbidity Survey. It's got thousands and thousands of people, asked them a whole bunch of questions, 10 years later asked them more. And what that lets you do then is say, well, what about what was going on at, at that first appointment tells me about what happens in the next 10 years. And what they found is there's a whole bunch of relationships between mental health diagnoses and people who reported thinking about suicide during those 10 years but no mental illness 
no number of mental illnesses, no combination of mental illnesses, predicted attempting or dying by suicide during the course of those next 10 years. Mental illness is not a robust predictor of suicidal behavior and suicide debt. It's a robust predictor of thinking about suicide. Those are two different things. And so it turns out that mental illness is a really good predictor. It tells us a lot about agony and suffering and victimization, but it tells us next to nothing about perpetration of interpersonal gun violence or engagement in suicidal behavior. And so when we're talking about the actual violence, when we're talking about the actual suicide attempt, mental illness is not giving us much information down the road. Um, it's talking about related issues, but not the same thing. So if it's not mental illness, then what? Well, I've already not so subtly alluded to a factor that, again, I'm not saying explains it all, at all. What I'm saying is an important factor that's getting undersold. And we're talking about firearm access. And so, again, I'm a suicide researcher. So most of my work focuses on the relationship between firearms and suicide risk. And one of my um, graduate students and I, Claire Houtsma, published a paper a couple years ago that built on research by Matt Miller and a bunch of other folks that's been going on for decades to look at, well, is firearm access really related to death by suicide? And so we looked at this at the state level, and yeah, firearm access is related to suicide death even when we account for mental illness, use of psychotropic medications, access to mental health care, social isolation, demographics, religion, geographic considerations. For some reason, people haven't fully pinned it down. The uh, average elevation above sea level of a state is extremely highly related to death by suicide. We put that in there too. Still didn't wipe it out religiosity, veteran status, all these things. And my point isn't that these other things weren't important. Many of them are extremely important. My point is that these other things did not explain away the relationship between firearm access and death by suicide. It's its own unique, robust, powerful predictor of being at risk of dying. Doesn't mean you don't also address these other things, but it means we can have a conversation about firearm access and not be doing something that's too far down the road or unrelated to the outcome of interest. We also know that the presence of a firearm in the home increases the risk for death by suicide 300 to 500% for everybody in that home compared to homes that don't have a firearm. And that that risk goes up even higher if the firearm is stored unsafely. And it's worth pausing for a second here to talk a little bit about language when I'm talking about safe storage. So I come at this from a suicide prevention perspective. And so the lens that I'm speaking through, uh, or the lens I'm looking through when I'm speaking about this, says, well, safe storage of a firearm means stored, stored unloaded, separate from ammunition, in a locked location, like a gun safe or a lockbox, ideally even with a trigger lock or cable lock or similar device on it, right? But if you ask the gun owners in Mississippi and the National Guard going through my clinical trial right now about safe storage, well, most of them own at least one firearm, typically a handgun, for protection in the home, to protect themselves and their loved ones in case of home invasion. And they're talking about safe storage. Well, one of those firearms needs to be loaded and on the ready in case of a home invasion at 3 in the morning. I don't want to be fumbling with a combination on my safe. But I need to be able to do this. And so when I say safe storage and they say safe storage, we're talking to each other. And we're talking about totally different things. And so when you're ta I, would, I would encourage, if anybody's not comfortable with what it means to store firearms safely or, or the different ways you can do that, talk to me. Talk to someone. Learn about this. Because you might be talking about something different than the person you're trying to reach. And if you're talking about two different things with the same words, again, you're not actually going to effectively create any progress. And so when I'm talking about safe storage, I'm talking about it from the suicide prevention perspective, keeping it separate from ammunition, storing it unloaded, storing it locked. And there's a variety of different systems. There's a spectrum of safety that exists. And folks who are owning a firearm for personal protection don't want it to be so difficult to access. There are a lot of different sort of compromise options available that are worth knowing about as clinicians. So you can, if they don't know about those, you can provide them with options they might be open to. So instead of prescribing someone a behavior they don't buy into, you collaboratively work with them to find something they do. So I'm saying all these things. Does that mean I'm saying mental illness is totally unrelated to gun violence and everyone involved in gun violence is thriving and feeling great? No, of course not. That's not what I'm saying. Again, so that's, it's an easy misread of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is no. Mental illness is not the primary factor in gun violence and is often not a factor at all. But firearm access, while not the only factor, is always always a factor in gun violence. There's never a time where access to firearms is somehow not an important factor in gun violence in whatever form that gun violence is taking. So 
if the data seems so clear to me on this, why does this belief persist? Well, here again, there's not one single reason, right? And so you don't want to oversimplify things, but I have not that many minutes, so I'm going to oversimplify things a little bit, and then hopefully we can together sort of uh, get, into the, get into the weeds a little bit more with it. But um, a chunk of it is just the way that the conversation is framed for us. So I'm not a media scholar. I'm trying to sort of learn more and more about this. Um, so I, you know, I feel a little bit more ignorant talking about this particular issue than I do about some of the other things. Um, but some of this is also pretty intuitive. It, it, so when you think about the media and, and how it operates, um, when the news media emphasizes a certain story and they highlight aspects of that story or interpretations and they de-emphasize others, that's going to impact the lived experience of the consumers of that media, right? So the news, whether you're reading it in print, online, consuming it through TV, through radio, they select information they're going to talk about. And then their competitors probably want to talk about that too because they don't want to be left behind. And so all of a sudden, things sort of become widely spoken about. And we didn't select that, right? You didn't tune in and say, hey, talk about this and talk about it in this way and present all these different options. They just sort of made a selection, right? And so if the media is going to talk about a certain issue in a certain way and not even argue against another perspective, but in fact ignore it altogether, then we're going to hear things in a certain way over and over and over again. And it's going to change the way or cement the way that we think about it so that our perception of reality might not map onto reality because we can't actually see what's happening in all the communities around the country impacted by the various forms of gun violence. And so there's research that shows that over the past couple of decades or more, the coverage of gun violence has increasingly focused on mental illness while de-emphasizing any discussion of public health more broadly or firearm access in particular. So over time, our discussion of gun violence through the media has become saturated with this one perspective. It's mental illness, it's mental illness, it's mental illness. And because there's some intuitive value and some truth to aspects of that, that doesn't result in much pushback from us as consumers, and so it's allowed to continue and persist. And that shapes our perspective and how we think about things. And unfortunately, when you have a media that's not focused on the data, what you then have is media consumers who are not given the right, they're not given facts to play with. They're given interpretations that deviate from those facts. And because of that, we become a less informed consumer base. So in my opinion, what you're getting here is essentially misdirected attention. And so I said this earlier, but the media tends to focus its gun violence conversations on mass shootings. And again, as I said before, and I'm going to reiterate, because I, I, it's really important to me that you, you understand me on this, I'm not here to de-emphasize our discussions on mass shootings. I don't think we need to talk about them less, but I think if we talk about them disproportionately relative to other forms of gun violence, that's where we run into trouble. Because then people start to think that's what gun violence is. And they don't create a sense of urgency to solve gun violence in the forms that it actually is and for the communities who are actually impacted by it. And we can all relate to the fear of school shootings, of my children, my grandchildren, myself, if I'm a student, could be impacted by this. Any person could come and do this, and, and I need to be protected from it. And we relate to it, and it creates a natural sense of urgency in us. But for a lot of folks, particularly folks not in a room in a suicide prevention conference, suicide feels pretty, pretty foreign. Um, Thomas Joyner was talking about that anti-suicidal thinking. A lot of folks are in that idea. And a lot of folks in our clinical trial talk about this isn't something that would ever happen to me. And so we don't think about it that way. It feels further off. And so the media sort of latches onto this thing that we're all naturally drawn towards, and they talk about it disproportionately. And they lose sight of the fact that the most common form of gun violence is in the country by a wide margin is suicide. And that firearm homicide, when it happens, tends not to happen within the context of mass shootings and school shootings. It tends to happen to underserved populations um, in urban environments who are not getting the resources and the attention that they need with respect to this problem. I will say that there is, depending on how you define mass shootings, how common they are is going to vary. So there's some debate about have mass shootings actually become more common or not. 
Maybe, maybe not, but what's clear is they have become more deadly. And so the other aspect of this is that it's not necessarily that mass shootings are happening more often, but when they do, the carnage is higher. And so again, that prompts more coverage and obviously and understandably more concern amongst the consumers of that coverage. So all this being said, with all these sort of misunderstandings and sort of skewed presentations things, the bottom line is there's actually a lot of support. And I'm going to talk for a minute about legislative solutions. That, that's not the only solution I'm going to put out there, but let's talk about legislation for a second. There's actually pretty broad support. Um, historically, though, when you talk about what people would call restrictive legislation, um, they tend to talk about restricting access to firearms amongst people with mental illness. And there are folks out there, Jeffrey Swanson at Duke, Applebaum, people who have been doing really impressive research on this, um, who've pointed out actually when you look at forms of legislation specifically focusing on mental illness, they're far less effective at reducing firearm homicide or suicide rates. Um, they work better when things are, are broader. And so this idea of, of legislation focused on mental illness is consistent with the narrative that we hear a lot, but it's inconsistent with the data. The data supports legislation that either is broadly population-based or focused on behaviors, specific behaviors instead of mental illness. So things like universal background checks, especially when they're paired with licensing laws, mandatory waiting periods, and extremist protection orders, which some folks will refer to as red flag laws, although I'd caution against that. The Coalition to Stop Gun Violence are, are, are sort of one of the big folks behind ERPOs, and their point, which actually makes sense to me, is that if you want folks to buy into this, and you, you want the gun owning community to be like, yes, this sounds good, maybe don't call them red flags, right? Think about the last time someone called you a red flag, and you're like, yeah, man, that's me, and I feel good about it. Like, again, not so much, right? So like rolls off the tongue better than ERPO. Um, nonetheless, maybe worth the effort to go with ERPO um, so that people feel less put off by it. Remember that the, the experience of the person you're talking to might be different than yours. And so the reaction to the word that you use might be different than yours. And I do think all of us can think about words that people use that unintentionally cause us distress. This is one of those words that makes sense to us that might be unintentionally causing distress and getting in the way. So ERPO, I would, I'd encourage. Um, I could be totally off base on that, but, but it makes sense to me. Um, so I'm talking about just sort of broad support, but unsurprisingly, it's pretty partisan, right? So almost nine out of 10, or nine out of 10 folks who self-identify as Democrats say, yeah, I support this kind of legislation. Uh, we're talking less than half of folks who self-identify as Republicans, right? And gun ownership is much higher amongst folks who self-identify as Republican or conservative, um, and firearm suicide rates are higher in states that uh, tend to vote more conservatively. And so support that's stronger in places that might actually need it less isn't the best arrangement. That being said, let's look at a, a sort of a handful of, of forms of legislation that have various levels of support in terms of preventing homicide or suicide or both. Um, and for some of them, it's pretty broad support. So for both universal background checks and a 10-year ban on ownership for folks who violate domestic violence restraining orders, you have extremely high support, not only from non-gun owners, but from gun owners more broadly and from folks who identify as NRA members. So that's bipartisan support on those guys. Other laws, less so. So you look at things like safe storage requirements and licensing laws, the non-gun owners are like, yeah, man, I'm behind that. Um, but the people who actually own firearms, and particularly if they self-identify as NRA members, not so much. And so again, things that only people who don't have firearms support, probably, I'm not arguing against them, I will forcefully argue for anything that has evidence base, but you have to think about how you're selling these points and why they are not supported by folks who would benefit more from them. And so it might not be yelling, hey, this works, you should do it over and over again. It might require a different type of conversation to create more support from the folks you're actually trying to reach. So we have these skewed conversations going on. I'm sensitive to time, so I've only got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to hurry through some of these things. But um, the narrative that the, is driven by the media and by special interest groups like lobbyists um, has resulted in a skewed perception about the causes and solutions for gun violence and the most frequent forms of gun violence. There's data out there coming out, gets published all the time about what, how such a high percentage of folks think um, mass shootings are more common than suicides or homicides outside of the context of mass shootings. And it's just factually incorrect. And so these, these narratives are promoted and maintained and it creates a real problem. Um, and the bottom line is, is 
what we have is a lack of political will. There's not a lack of general support for at least some of these solutions. There's a lack of a will to implement them. And that's unfortunate. And that will is gonna come from demand, but that demand has to come in a way that has broader appeal. It sounds like it's coming from not just one side of the story, right? And at the same time, if there is lack of political will, it's much easier for an elected official to blame mental illness, even as in states like where I live, mental health budgets are being slashed. So even as you're slashing the apparent solution to the thing you're blaming, you're blaming it because it's easier than pushing back against lobbyists or, or narratives that have taken such hold that you can't convince someone anything else. So why is this a problem? I, I would argue it just shows that we're distracted, right? Like, you can't solve the problem if you're looking in the wrong place. And misinformation about mental illness and gun violence is going to sustain efforts to solve the problem in ways that actually aren't evidence-based, right? So we actually have solutions. So where I'm going here in a second is that we actually have a menu of options we could use that would be really useful. And some of them are the legislation I mentioned, but a lot of them aren't. But we aren't emphasizing those because we're trying to solve the problem and explain the problem in a different way. And so... A study that uh, we have just actually revised and resubmits. We're about to submit the sucker back in there. A grad student of mine, Sam Darawalo, and I um, collected data from a service called Mechanical Turk. And we got a couple of hundred American firearm owners and actually just got a second sample now with 400 more that we're going to add to this. But we asked them a bunch of things. But one of the things we did was we asked them a question similar to that Gallup poll that I told you earlier. And we said, look, we know a lot of things are factored into gun violence. But if you were going to say what's the most primary cause between these two, mental illness or access to a firearm, what, what do you think? And then we also looked at, well, to what extent are your beliefs on that related to other beliefs about firearms and behaviors related to firearms? And what we found in our sample is a pretty even split between folks who think this is purely a mental health issue and folks who think it's at least partly has to do with access to firearms. And what we found is that the folks who blame gun violence and entirely on mental illness were less likely to believe that firearm ownership or storage are related to suicide risk. We know those are. That's not really debatable. That's, that's, that's unambiguous data. They're also less likely to believe in means substitution. So the idea if you stop someone from attempting suicide with one method, they'll just find another. We also know that that does not tend to be the case. And in the case of firearms, if it were, if you opted to another method, it's going to be less lethal than firearms. They were also less willing to store firearms safely to prevent their own suicide. They were more likely to believe mass shootings are more common than suicide. They're more likely to endorse conservative beliefs, which is important because in a separate sample, we also found that conservative beliefs were, more, were if you look at a sample of folks who died by suicide, conservative beliefs were associated, controlling for other, a lot of other factors, with the likelihood of having died by suicide using a firearm, right? So those beliefs represent a propensity to select that method if you were to become suicidal. It's not a criticism of conservative beliefs. It's just a note that this worldview is more associated with making that decision in that moment. They're also less likely to believe that legislation, specifically universal background checks, waiting periods, or extremist protection orders, or opposed, would be helpful in preventing either mass shootings or suicides. So what does this tell us? It shows that a belief that gun violence is driven primarily by mental illness might be emblematic of, reflective of, a whole suite of beliefs and behaviors that are inconsistent with some pretty unambiguous data, and that's a problem. And this style of belief is being facilitated and maintained by a whole host of folks, stakeholders, who should instead be speaking about this differently to help folks see things differently. Not to brainwash folks, not to just show them one side of the story, but just to show them, hey, here's the data. Make some informed choices. But let me show you what we've actually learned so that you can make those informed choices. And so this means we need a cultural shift in how we think and talk about gun ownership. And, the, and gun violence. So how will shifting this conversation away from mental illness help? Well, it will help us start to focus on the solutions that exist. And so I had intended to go through what each of these are in great detail, and I'm not going to, but I'm happy to come back and talk about them. But my point in this slide and the next one, so we have a whole lot of solutions that are not legislatively based, where there's no reason why there couldn't be bipartisan support, that are not a threat to anyone's rights or cultures, but which have been shown, particularly in the case of homicide, to reduce rates of gun deaths. And so gun violence intervention is a community-driven, comprehensive gun violence prevention program. And in cities that have adopted it and fully implemented it, you've seen 30 to 60% reductions in homicide 
in the city, sustained for years. There's cure violence, which is related, but it, it adopts what you could essentially think of as conduits. They're violence interrupters, folks who embed themselves in the community and get to know everybody and the dynamics and work to interrupt gun violence and certainly uh, revenge shootings to, again, reduce the violence rates. And cities that have adopted that, you've seen a 38, almost 40% reduction in homicide rates. You also have hospital-based hospital violence intervention. There was an amazing talk yesterday on DLive that's going on in Detroit. That's exactly an example of this type of program. And cities that have adopted those programs, which are working on reducing injury-based recidivism in, in emergency rooms, um, you've seen a fourfold decrease in folks who've been admitted to the ED for gunshot wounds coming back for injuries down the road, right? So you're, you're breaking that cycle of continuously going in and out. Um, so those exist. We just don't use them very much. What about suicide? We have a lot of potential op options. They haven't been studied as well, though, as those, right? So we need a little bit more data on these work. But you've got things like gunshot projects, where you are providing uh, materials to be uh, hung up in gun shops about uh, resources, about safe storage methods, and training retailers to identify risk in folks who are coming in to buy a firearm, potentially to use it on themselves. You've got lethal means counseling. I talked about doing a clinical trial in Mississippi right now. That's the intervention we're using. And this involves an interaction where you, you speak to gun owners um, about ways they may be willing to change their storage behavior either all the time or at least during moments of crisis, whether it's storing it more safely or temporarily storing away from home. We've also got storage maps. Emmy Betts in Colorado is leading the charge on this. It's a really innovative thing where they're just making Google map lists from state to state. Colorado is the most well-established one. Um, of gun retailers and law enforcement places that are willing to be listed for you to call and say, hey, can I store my firearm with you? Because um, a lot of people just don't know, They're like, okay, you want me to store away from home? How do I do that legally? Where do I even do that? And so providing that information, free of charge, readily available, updating it, um, creates a resource where folks can actually solve the problem for themselves and maintain autonomy. So if we focus on mental illness, we lose sight of environmental interventions. A focus specifically on the role of firearms promotes efforts to directly address accessibility and the root of the problem. For suicide, as I mentioned, this evidence base is robust for interventions that focus on decreasing the lethality or accessibility of specific methods for suicide, especially if they're commonly used and highly lethal. In the case of firearms, that's the case in the United States. With respect to homicide, particularly in urban space, the evidence is for interventions focused on empowering the local community directing high-risk folks to the resources they need in order to break the cycle and developing actual true partnerships with law enforcement. What you don't see across any of these areas of gun violence is evidence that a focus on mental illness and institutionalization resulting in a decrease in gun violence. Nowhere is that seen. And so the solution you would think is the natural response to the cause that a lot of people blame doesn't work. These other solutions do. So it might be that we have to change the conversation. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I think we've got like two minutes for questions, maybe. Am I waiting for uh, microphones or just calling on people? OK, I am waiting for the microphone. You had the slide up there that said there's a 300 to 500 uh, percent increase of risk of gun death and regarding owners of guns who do not, who want them for protection. Do you share or have you done any research or focus groups on the, that group that wants to have a gun for protection to, uh, that they've changed their mind when you've given them that stat? So, so that... What I will say, that stat is a, it's a little bit broader in that it's a, it's a three to five times or 300 to 500% increase of risk for death by suicide for anybody in the home when there's a firearm in the home. But the most common reason endorsed for wanting to own firearms, if you had to list one reason, is protection in the home. And those folks are the most difficult conversation to have because what you're asking them to do is incompatible with what they believe this tool is best used for, right? So they're saying, I own this for this very reasonable reason. And you're saying, what if you didn't? 
Um, and that doesn't work. So, so giving them that can be helpful, but generally speaking, when someone has an entrenched opinion, you don't move them with numbers, right? So you move them with a conversation. So we're, we have had success in those conversations, but not by saying, look at this number, you're wrong, do it different. We might mention that number, but say, that might not sound like it's relevant to you. And, and we have a conversation about, well, what are you willing? What if that changed? What if this relevant? What plan are you willing to make? And what we found, I think, in our intervention, we use something called motivational interviewing. And I don't think using motivational interviewing is the key, but what that intervention does is it doesn't let you be a jerk and argue with people. And I think that the mechanism that works on intervention is don't be a jerk. And so we have conversations people expect to be a fight, and it's not. And so these folks have been like, I'm not going to do that. Come back six months later, and they say, you know, I, got, I broke up with my fiance, and I thought about that conversation. And I gave my guns to my mother or my brother, um, and I appreciate that. And I think that that came, again, from our clinicians not arguing with them or forcing the message, but instead hearing their perspective, reflecting back, but still trying to guide them to safety. I have a comment. Yeah. Everybody in this room can do something when the, radio, when the uh, media reports something. You have the ability to call the station and say something to them because I've done this before and I argued with them until they said they would change the next report. You know, so they right away say something this whether it's gun violence or or a homicide by another cause, they're always blaming it on mental illness. So there is something everyone in the room can do as far as media is concerned. So in our community, we had a, a suicide action network, and we invited gun owners to one of our mm -hmm. group meetings. And initially, it was really, I think everybody's tensions were up. Mm -hmm. And um, there were a lot of things that I didn't understand about what universal background checks that we do have and why they, where the loopholes are. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that educated us. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we did, and the other thing was they had some traumas where someone had actually made a, actually killed themselves on their range mm -hmm. and how traumatic it was for them. And they don't want someone to buy a gun and use it to kill someone else or themselves. And so they were very open to us doing safe talk training. So we have that scheduled and it, awesome. it felt good on both sides and yeah. they were very willing to do that. So, um, that something doable. Absolutely, and you're seeing collaborations like that pick up in frequency across the country, and I would encourage you just, you're not gonna solve gun suicide without gun owners. That's a pretty important part, and so if you alienate them, um, you're probably not gonna make a lot of progress. I'd encourage you to reach across the aisle on that. So thank you very much, guys.